Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, no slip-ups. It's a big day in the title race. Jurgen Klopp orders his Liverpool players to power on at the top with victory over Chelsea. Neil Warnock, he somehow bites his lip after losing at Burnley, but Cardiff's manager, he's still facing three separate FA charges. And Joe Barton, he's in big trouble again. The Fleetwood boss, he's been questioned by police after allegedly clashing with the Barnsley manager, Daniel Stendhal, yesterday at Oakwell. Here to discuss all that and much more, Matt Dickinson is the chief sports writer with The Times. Matt Law is football news correspondent with The Daily Telegraph. And Dave Maddock, he's back. He's the Daily Mirror's northern football correspondent. It's been a while, David, hasn't it? Yeah, huh? Welcome yeah. back. Good to see you. Um, don't forget, you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. Uh, the best will appear on the screen over the next 90 minutes. OK, let's have a look at the papers. Back of the mail on Sunday this morning. Uh, Barton in new shame after this alleged incident at Oakwell yesterday. The mail all over this story. Mike Keegan and Stephen Davis. The mail also all over this one as well. Chelsea, three groups uh, separately in a £2.5 billion race to buy Chelsea. We might get into that a little bit later on. The Sunday Mirror, they've got the Barton story on the back, as most page papers have this morning. But Guardiola dropping a city quit hint. He was asked about uh, Roy Hodgson, his opponent in the dugout today down at Crystal Palace. Hodgson, 71. Pep says he won't be managing when he gets to that age. Pep, uh, his contract up at the end of next season at Manchester City. The Sunday People, Old Trafford wages lure. For Christian Eriksen, they'll pay him £240,000 a week, according to the people this morning. Back of the sun. Um, or keep an eye on this reporter. Young, up and coming. Uh, keep on his coattails. Southgate is Troy Stoy. Would he really call up Troy Deeney? Uh, Equalised for Watford last week in the FA Cup semi-final um, against Wolves at Wembley. He is the hero of the moment. Would he really get an England call for the Nations League uh, tie against uh, Holland in June? Uh, front of the observer. Pogba was spot on. A um, couple of goals yesterday for him at Old Trafford. Manchester United um, getting through eventually to beat uh, West Ham. Front of the Sunday Express. Uh, boy, that was great. Lucas Moura with his hat-trick yesterday. Um, White Hart Lane got a new favourite song, I think. Uh, front of the Sunday Mirror's goals pull out as well. The long kiss goodbye. Uh, Neil Warnock not happy with Mike Dean yesterday for reversing a decision. Um, over a penalty incident at uh, Turf Moor. He's got a chance, though, to put that all right on Tuesday night because uh, Brighton are hosting Cardiff. Huge game, that. We're going to get into that game. It's a big one in part two of today's programme. But first up, let's uh, talk about the big game at Anfield because it is, of course, Liverpool against Chelsea. It's a significant one historically in the title race and it will be again today. But first, Dave, just want to touch... Um, on uh, Tommy Smith, who passed away at the age of 74 um, on Friday. Uh, four league titles as a Liverpool player, the European Cup in 1977. What, uh, what did Tommy Smith mean to, to Liverpool and to the air and to the fabric of that football club? Uh, I think Tommy um, perhaps was one of the key players in, in setting the modern Liverpool, the, the, the team that now we see, the club that we see, which is obviously one of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. He he was a, f a fundamental part of that. He he came uh, with Shankly, really. He, he, as a as a 16-year-old, he was taken on by Shankly in his, I think, in, in his first season as manager. And um, he was part of the first Shankly title-winning side. But I think, more importantly, um, he was made captain when Shankly broke up the team in uh, at the end of the, mm. uh, the 60s. And... Um, and he became captain in the 73 season when Liverpool won the title again. And from 73 uh, through to 1990, Liverpool actually had the, the greatest period of dominance in English football history because they, uh, in those, I think, 19 seasons there, they, they won the title 11 times and finished second seven times. So only once in 19 seasons did they not finish in the top two and it was Tommy Smith who was the captain for the first part of that who's kind of set the set the tone set set the standard if you like uh, for what became the the, the the biggest dominance in, in English football and I think Liverpool became the club that they are and the club that they are now which is perhaps only behind Manchester United in terms of sort of world recognition mm. um, because of the, the part that he played, for sure. 
I don't know if you ever experienced this, but Ollie Holt uh, in his column is a great anecdote today of when he first went, his first ever trip to Anfield uh, as a reporter. Um, and uh, he said there's a few knowing smiles when, when Ollie sat down in the old press box there yeah. in the main stand. And all of a sudden, Tommy Smith walked over and said, that's my seat. And yeah. Ollie said, well, I've never moved as quickly uh, then or since. That's true. You, you, never, you, you, only, you only sat in his seat once, put it that way. <laughs> and, it, and it happened to everybody. It would kind of almost be an initiation sort of processing because he, he worked for years for the, for the local paper sure. and he had a seat in the, in, in the press box and it was his seat. Yeah. Tommy Smith, a big part, of course, of uh, Liverpool's history, he passed away on Friday at the age of 74. Um, let's get into today's game. David, because most of the previews, of course, it, it, it's, it, it, it triggers memories, of course, of the Brendan Rodgers team that played Chelsea um, and the famous slip, Stevie G's famous slip at Anfield. Um, how have things changed since in the intervening years? It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's natural to, to sort of look back on that, on that game. You, you, yeah. can't, you, you can't look at Liverpool-Chelsea without, yeah. without remembering Gerard's yeah. slip. But actually, I think... Uh, Liverpool, Liverpool only have three players in their entire squad that, that were there, mm -hmm. that were in the squad in, in 2014. And, and only one of them is, it could, could play today, and, and that would be Jordan Henderson. And he didn't play in that game in 2014. Chelsea also, I think they only have two players left as well. So, I mean, it, that kind of just shows you the incredible turnover in modern football. But also, uh, I was at the press conference with, with Klopp on Friday, and he said... It has nothing to do with this game whatsoever, and, and yeah. he's absolutely right. That there's no bearing on this game at all from from 2014. Yeah. But I think there's a sense that um, a sense of Liverpool need a redemption, possibly from from that that not not that game, but that season when they came so close, but but perhaps just. Lost their way slightly in that game. They, yeah. they, they showed their inexperience in that game. They, sure. they, they got to the point where they didn't actually have to beat Chelsea that day. They only needed a point, and Chelsea sat back. Chelsea, the first 20 minutes of the game, kept the ball off the pitch for all but six minutes. Right. So the ball was only in play for six minutes of the first 20. And Liverpool, instead of saying, "Well, that's fine because we only need a draw," keep it off, keep it off for 90 minutes. They, 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 they lost their heads a bit. Yeah. And I think what, we, what, what they want to do today, what the fans will want to see, is Liverpool showing a very different approach, being measured and calm and, and, and being confident in where they are now. They're big rivals, of course, historically, Liverpool and uh, Chelsea. Met. Is, the, is the intensity still there? Can we, can we still feel it between these two teams? Certainly between the fans. I mean, I think, you know... Chelsea fans, as, as Liverpool fans the other way, we, would revel in, in trying to give them a bloody nose today. Um, Chelsea feel like a different team now. They're, under Mourinho and then under even Conte, they were quite a cynical team. They liked going out. If they couldn't win, they liked kind of ruining it for their rivals. You know, they ruined it for Liverpool. They ruined it for with Conte. They ruined it for Tottenham. And they would celebrate that almost as much as, as winning themselves if they couldn't win. Under Sari now, it is a little bit different. They've got a different... They don't have the nasty characters and the, the Costas and the Fabregases of this world. And the manager is different in that I can't... He might go out more compact and more defensive, but I can't see him going out cynically trying to actually sort of kill that game in the same way Mourinho or Conte might do. And I can't see him taking so much personal pleasure from trying to ruin it for Liverpool. I don't think that side of it will matter to him at all. So I don't see Chelsea's team talk particularly being about let's wreck this for Liverpool, whereas a Mourinho or Conte may well have got into that. Yeah. So I do think they're very different. And I'll be interested to see how they set up today because the last few games, Sarri's actually won round the fans a little bit by putting in Hudson-Odoi, putting in Loftus-Cheek which has made them a bit more exciting, but does make them more open as well. Now, other managers would go to Liverpool and try and really close it down, and he might be tempted to, but what's kind of got the fans off his back recently is making them more open, which could play into Liverpool's hands a little bit. Yeah. Does it matter, Matt, who goes first here? Man City, of course, play at Palace first up this afternoon. They'll know, of course, they will know the result by the time they walk onto the field at Anfield. 
Do these things make any difference to the players and to the, to the mentality and the approach? Um, they, can, uh, they can do within individuals, I think, but uh, I mean, I'm sure Klopp will be trying to keep everything totally focused on, on what's to come. I mean, yeah, there's, there's enough games left for there to, no one to be you know, thinking this is, this is the one. But uh, I mean, ultimately, I think Dave's, Dave's right. I think there's this feeling when you look at the, the remaining fixtures of both teams that if Liverpool get through this one, if win this one, Psychologically, that will be huge. I mean, it's, it's definitely their toughest game. You look at City, have got Spurs um, to come in Europe and in the league. They've got the Manchester derby, which is, you know, City going to be favourites, but is inevitably going to have all the, mm -hmm. the feistiness of a derby. So I, th I think for Liverpool, this does feel a particularly big afternoon just because it looks like the biggest hurdle they've got. Yeah. How significant was Henderson's chat with, um, with Klopp about his, his role at the base of this uh, midfield? He wanted to play a more advanced role and we saw when he came on as substitute the frustration that Southampton, when he came on, scored, scored his goal and it was, you could see it was such an important goal to him and he hinted then that he had those conversations with Klopp but then that's developed as the days have progressed. He did have a conversation. Klopp, Klopp joked about it in the press conference, said, yeah, a player can come in and tell me he plays in a position and I'll put him there. Obviously, that didn't happen. Yeah. He, 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 Klopp clearly knows, because he played in that position when he first arrived, that he can do that role. I think it's significant. Um, perhaps Henderson himself realises that. and he, In fact, he did. He did an interview with us this week and he said... That, that, that Fabino is more natural in that, in that holding role which Henderson himself has been playing the last couple of years. And, and Liverpool have looked better with Fabino playing that role this season, looked a little calmer and, and maybe his passing is a little more incisive from that position. So Henderson himself is the captain and I think he, he realises that his role might be limited, his, his, his opportunities in the number six. So he needs to develop again in different areas to give himself more chance of playing and I think that's that's the significance of it. It'd be interesting to see whether he actually starts today, Henderson. Yeah, I mean these these critical sort of fi these critical fixtures between now and the end of the season, Dave, for Liverpool, where will the title be one loss? Who are the crucial players that Klopp will look to to get this to win this title? Well, Van Dijk, for a start. Van Dijk's the difference this season. You, you, you look at, they've conceded 20 goals all season, the, the, the least number of goals conceded in the Premier League, and, mm -hmm. and Van Dijk is a huge part of that. He's, he's not been beaten, he's not been dribbled past for over a year in the, in the Premier League and the Champions League. And it sounds impossible, statistic, but it's true. He hasn't, in the take-ons, the stats that they now do, a whole year. It's March last year that he, he's... We've got the training stats. <laughs> they don't go past him in training ever. Salah. Well, apparently not. Apparently, he, he, he's, cause he's this wall. He, he's, his reading of the game is obviously massive. And actually, I mean, it could be key today because Hazard, as we know, is his great ability, and we saw it against West Ham, was dropping deep and then running at the centre-halves and just skipping by them. So if there's one defender you want who can defend against that, it's a guy who's not been dribbled past for, for over a year. Yeah. So he's, he's a massive difference, and then obviously they'll, they'll need the, the forwards to step, keep stepping up as they've done all season. Yeah, where, where are we on Hazard Watch at the moment, uh, Matt? Uh, I know you wrote at the start of the week that Real Madrid, pretty confident they are going to sign him this summer. Yeah. Um, how far down the line is it? They've certainly made contact with Chelsea. I think negotiations are well on the way now. I think they've been talking figures. Um, they're at two different places with figures at the moment. Chelsea, even with only a year left on his contract, want at least 100 million, if not more. Mm. I think Real Madrid probably don't want to pay more than what they paid for Gareth Bale of about 85, 86. I think they'll get there because the player's desperate to go. He's definitely not going to sign a new contract, even if Chelsea just said no to Real Madrid all summer, he mm. wouldn't end up signing a new contract. They know they'll end up losing him on a free if they don't do it. Um, so, yeah, it's well underway and it's all heading to him going. I think Real Madrid want to do it pretty quick as well. I can see it, him getting the move by the start of the summer, really. Right. Matt, you wrote about it on Friday in your column, didn't mm. you? The, the, this failure of English clubs to be able to keep hold of their, the well, best talent in the, in the Premier League. It's the one, it's the one thing that we... We can't seem to win, and I don't think ever will win, that lure of Barcelona and Real Madrid among certain players. It's there, and you can't, you know, you can understand it, particularly Hazard in his case. Zidane was his hero as a kid, um, and he grew up watching the Galacticos, and you can imagine that, you know, 
you can't get too romantic about um, 100 million pound deals yep. and big pay rises, but it's you can understand his desire to go and and it's a fact, you know, we've seen it with Suarez before, we've seen it with Coutinho, Liverpool. I mean, they've done very well out of the money they, they, they recouped on that. But that's, that's the best you can do is get, get the huge fee and spend it wisely. Yeah. Um, City playing uh, Palace this afternoon. Did we see any signs, did we see any signs of vulnerability um, when they lost at Tottenham in the Champions League? The first, first leg, of course, the second leg to come um, at the Etihad on, uh, on Wednesday night. But did we see any vulnerabilities in this city side on Tuesday? Well, I mean, myself and Matt both wrote about Guardiola's team selection and the way he set up for that game, which was a surprise. I mean, he looked like he was going very cautious there, um, not to lose the game and not to lose the tie like they had done against Liverpool, you know, in the first leg. And it seemed a real departure from, from the way he, he goes about his business normally. And it, it didn't work, it just didn't. It was stodgy in midfield. Mares couldn't really get into the game or make any significant impact. It was strange. Um, I'd, I'd be wary of kind of using that performance, though, to judge them for the rest of the, the title run. And it, it seemed like a, a one-off team selection. It seemed something he did almost as a response to what happened against Liverpool in the Champions League and, and very much keeping the tie alive, which they still have done. They're only one goal behind. So I can't see that being part of their, their Premier League form. And also with Guardiola, it's weird. You, you almost have to separate them at the moment. There's the Premier League Guardiola and the domestic Guardiola, who's you know, amazing and done incredibly. And then there's the Champions League Guardiola, who, going back to his Bayern Munich days, seems to have found it tough when they've come to the real crunch games. So, no, I, I suspect... I mean, we're both at the Palace game later, and I would expect them to, to Bruyne to be back in... The, be back to their kind of very attacking front foot style rather than, you know, sitting off a little bit more. We're always reluctant to doubt managers, but that <laughs> makes a great point about the Champions League, doesn't it? Because the great, the great Barcelona teams that, uh, that he was in charge of, 2009, of course, 2011. Um, but his failure, the Monaco, the Monaco game in his first season in charge, last season as well against Liverpool, when he wasn't prepared for that first leg, is, there, is it just a difference in mindset, competition, the way that he approaches it, or well, the think, expectations, Matt? I think those two, the last two years, have, well, obviously they, they could yet go through against Spurs, you know, and who'd be, who could be surprised. But yeah, yeah. The, 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 the game last week and last, it does look like he's sort of overthought it, or, or yeah, mm -hmm. he's, he's got, you know, he's got it slightly wrong. I mean, I was, we were talking about it before, you know, we sort of um, get put in our place by um, plenty of people when you dare to question Guardiola, yeah. but. Maybe he's not infallible. You know, maybe he makes. You know, and these these are games that are tiny margins. They were up against the Spurs, who were absolute. You know, front foot were were un, un Spurs like in in the feistiness, which you know obviously cost Harry Kane in the end. But it was a very sort of aggressive Spurs performance. And um, yeah, it, it felt like. I mean, at the moment, I can't see much. You know, if you've got a huge game. It was really surprising to see Mares in the starting eleven. Really surprising to see Kevin De Bruyne not in it. And yeah. and this European question um, is 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 justified, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they, City have got a squad that is more than capable of winning this Champions League. Yeah. Just finally, the Guardiola. Um, it's been teased out of the boys ahead of this game. Uh, teased out of Guardiola by the boys, shall I say? Um, the Roy Hodgson, um, 71 years old. Uh, Pep says that. Forget it. At 48, I won't be around at the same age as Roy Hodgson. I certainly won't be coaching football teams or manager of, being manager of football teams. Is he that kind of guy? You can just see him walking away as he did at Barcelona, as he effectively did. I can see him giving himself Munich. another sabbatical. I mean, he's, he's, he's smart in a lot of ways, isn't he? And one of them is to go to a club, do three or four years, give it everything, squeeze every single drop he can out of these players. We all know how intense he is. You hear all the stories yeah. about just how relentless. He is not just with players, but with staff. You know, people find him hard work to be around because he demands so much of of everyone all the time. But and he does that for three or four years. Then he says, "I need a long holiday." He can clearly afford one, um, and he goes off, takes a break, and then comes back. So I, I suspect he'll do the same at City. He'll do another year, maybe two, um, and then he'll give himself a a year on a beach, and then. Come yeah. back somewhere else. Yeah, if, yeah. if he wins four, he, he might could even go at the end of this season. It, yeah. it would be that if he wins all four trophies, it'd be the perfect time for him to go. In four. A sense, wouldn't he? he says it's five. 
<laughs> Cancer yeah. Community Shield. Yeah. Um, okay, end of the day, end of the day's play. Where um, who will be on top? Who will finish the day on top? I, I have a feeling for Liverpool today against Chelsea. So, um, so they'll still and, be there. Yeah. So if they beat Chelsea, mm -hmm. obviously they'll be they'll be top still. But City will have the game in hand. Yep. I, I, I can see Liverpool winning today. Mm -hmm. No. I can just having said that Chelsea aren't the same cynical side, and I don't think they're doing the same way. I can just see maybe Chelsea nicking a draw today. No. Uh, I think Liverpool will do it, but. Which isn't the same as saying they're yeah. going to win the league. Yeah, but yeah, sure. Yeah. But you think they'll yeah. win today, yeah? Yeah, I think okay. they will. OK. Good stuff. We'll be able to find out because all the games, of course, they're on Sky a little bit later on. From 1 o'clock, you'll be able to watch the action um, from uh, Sellers Park. It's Palace against Man City and followed by Liverpool against Chelsea a little bit later on. Uh, you'll also be able to follow the action about this man as well. We'll talk about him coming next. Neil Warnock, the long kiss. Goodbye. Cardiff losing at Burnley yesterday. They've got a big game on Tuesday night at Brighton. More on that next. Welcome back. OK, let's talk uh, about the relegation battle now. Let's start with Cardiff, Matt. Um, they lost at uh, Burnley 2-0 um, yesterday. Five points adrift. They've got a big game now against uh, Brighton on Tuesday night. It's a huge game down at MX um, for them. Um, let's, before we get on to Neil Warner, but the, let's first of all talk about the, the penalty incident. Mm -hmm. I love the wry smile on your face there. Um, but uh, the penalty incident, this is Ben, this is ben Me, uh, originally given by Mike Dean. Um, I think it's Darren Can, isn't it, on, the, on yeah. the, um, his assistant, um, who flags for handball. Mike Dean goes over and uh, changes his, uh, his mind. Neil Warnock not happy, but let's go through, let's just talk about the incident first of all and um, whether you think it should have been given. Um, no, I don't, because, I mean, he headed it onto his hand, didn't he? I, yeah. It didn't... I don't think that, that that's particularly a penalty. But I do agree that once he's given it, I can't quite understand what's changed his mind there. I mean, he seemed to have a better view of it than the assistant. Uh, I, I can only guess maybe he didn't realise that, the, the, that Ben Mee had headed it onto his hand to start with. It, it, it hit his hand first. But I struggle to understand where the confusion has then come in. I think if you've given it, you've given it, and you, you have to stick with that. Um, I do think at the end of it, they got it right. I actually think they had other, two other penalty shouts in that game, didn't they? A handball and also a foul in the area, and I actually thought they were better shouts for penalties. But, I, I mean, coming on to Warner, I can understand why he's going mad. I mean, he's had the Chelsea situation a couple of weeks ago, which I was at, where they were really hard done by, and not just on the Aspilicueta goal, on several big decisions. And then he's had a huge decision yesterday, and also two other penalty shouts that could have gone for him. I can understand why he's... He's going mad. I mean, he can quite. I think he can quite justifiably argue that the officials have cost Cardiff four points, pretty much in Look, the last few luckily games. Luckily, we've got VAR to come and sort it all out <laughs> next season because no, well, no one argues after yeah. that. Well, the, so. the interesting thing is, I think having you know having been at Tottenham in midweek, the, the other penalty, the other handball in the penalty area, certainly in Europe with VAR, would have been given. Yeah, that's exactly it. That yeah. that that's you know. A shot, a goal-bound shot, an yeah. arm that is not. Danny Rose, for example. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That I think you're right. I think that first one would have, the first me one would have qualified on, under in the Europe. European yeah. sil silhouette rules. Um, but this is the whole issue that the, the Danny Rose thing threw up is that we're going to have to. The Premier League is going to have to change to fall in line with Europe. I think otherwise there's going to be even more confusion, or, you know, or there's going to Europe's going to have to reverse. These, I, I mean, I think that's the one thing that they are getting wrong mm. about these, the, the VAR. I think it's it's now expanded handball too far, but mm. yeah, well, that's I'm, an ongoing debate. It is because it's, why don't we have that consistency, Matt? Well, because you know, um, bits of Europe of of and, and other competitions have brought in VAR quicker. It's been, let's say, this push on it that it's um, because these incidents can be seen that. VR can be used. It started at the World Cup, which I say VR actually worked really well at the World Cup, apart from two handballs, which one of which was in the final. I just I think I don't think these are penalties when a ball flashes by and it it flicks off. Um, but people in authority at UEFA and FIFA decided they are, and then say the Premier League's got a big decision to make this summer with VAR arriving about whether we fall in line with the rest of Europe because it's going to cause a lot of confusion if we don't. 
Yeah, still causing a lot of confusion um, in the Premier League. Neil, one not happy yesterday. Um, again, great line in Mike Keegan's piece this morning um, when he says Neil Warnock, uh, he wearily trudged up the tunnel um, and uh, walked past the doping officials and said, I hope you're testing uh, the referee, which of course he was joking. But um, the serious side of this is that these decisions, as Matt said, are costing Cardiff week after week. Well, he spoke a few weeks ago <laughs> and said, this is the last 20 years. This is all coming back to haunt yeah. him. Would referees really feel that way? Would would that over the years would that would that have worked a way into their psyche and the way they approach games? When Neil Warnock is the manager, no, no, it wouldn't. It it, it can't and and it wouldn't. Well, it should. I think it would. Uh, actually, I do. But I'll let Dave. <laughs> it, it 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 wouldn't because in the end the referees of themselves are assessed and they know they have to uh, that they have to interpret the rules how it's laid down and, and, and you can't, the referees can't allow personality. I, I mean, if there's any justice in the world, it would for me because Warnock is a menace. He really is. But no, I, I, I genuinely don't believe it. I think perhaps maybe what, you, what you're confusing slightly is, I think there's no doubt when you look over, say, 20 years, there is that big club bias because the stadiums that the big clubs play in and the in intimid intimidating effect of that. And I think, undoubtedly, the big clubs do get decisions their way, especially in their stadiums. But, but to, to the referee saying, oh, that, he's horrible, I'm going to give, give awards against him, that just, that, that just doesn't happen. I would say... Uh, St George's uh, Park, on a, is it Monday morning when they meet, when the referees meet? I mean, they can't fa this incident can't fail to be mentioned. Well, the, the thing is, Ultimately, the officials were right. The, 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 both handballs were not handballs, although, as Matt says, the first handball from me, that would have been given by VAR in Europe. But in fact, this season's uh, interpretation in the Premier League would say that isn't a handball. And even, even the, the, the tackle, for me, you, you see the direction of the ball and, and he actually wins the ball on, on, on the tackle. Um, the problem is that the referee changed his mind on, on the me handball when it came off his head. And apparently he changed his mind because the, sec the other linesman, assist uh, assistant, saw it from 70 yards away. Mm. Clearly, you, you would question whether did he really see that or did the fourth official see a replay and then quickly tell him. You, you, we, we don't know that for sure, but if that's the case, then that is such a grey area because they're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. And, 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 and therefore, Warnock really does have a, 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 a complaint about that. But if it's the right decision, you know, who can we really complain about it? You think I, the officials have got it in for him? I have no way of proving this or no statistics to back it up, but I do think that officials will have a subconscious bias against managers who constantly hammer them. I really do. I used to think it with Mourinho for all his faults and for all he deserved, you know, some decisions to go against him and for however much he was in the wrong a lot of the time, I used to think it worked against him. I just think, even if it's subconsciously, not consciously, if you keep having one guy hammering you and getting on at the referees, and it's going to get into your psyche. It's going to influence sometimes. I just think it nobody, is. Nobody was worse, worse at that than Ferguson, Sir Alex Ferguson, and yet United, you would say, got decisions that they shouldn't have done. So I, 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 I can't believe that because... Ferguson I don't think a prime that, yeah that's, to, that's, to that's a good point that is a good point but I just think I think it happens with players as well I just think it can be a factor if it's a 50 50 decision that it ends up going against you I'm not saying anyone does it on purpose I'm not saying they go out to get these people I think that would be crazy to think that but I, I just think certainly with some officials it must get into their way of thinking it must mm. do okay they've got a chance though big chance on Tuesday night because it's against Brighton Matt Brighton lost 5-0 at home yesterday. Um, lost an FA Cup semi-final last week. Uh, did they lose their heads yesterday at the Amex? Um, I, think, I think we can safely say that Knockout did, um, he lost everything. Um, <laughs> I mean, as tackles go, it's just extraordinary what we're talking about. I mean, Cantona at his maddest, um, that sort of level. Um, what he was thinking, goodness only knows. And, I mean, utterly, you know, Talk about putting your side in, you know, even worse trouble than they already are. Which is, I mean, it's you know, everyone acknowledges Hughton has done a fantastic job. I think he took over when they were, 
you know, near the, mm. towards the bottom of the championship. They've, he's, he's, he's been, you know, we, we only have to look at Newcastle to know how easily under, you know, undervalued he can be as a manager. Um, his, his reign there has been hugely successful, but they have just been, this has been not a few weeks, this has been a, a run of going back a few months now, and lack of goals obviously is the, the very obvious thing to point out. There's been a lot of grumbling I've seen from fans about the feeling that they're setting up too, too cautiously. Um, uh, they've got a big chance to save themselves on, uh, on Tuesday night, and I, I've got a feeling they will, but, um, but it's, yeah. Um, proper mess. It's, it feels like one of the games of the season, isn't it? I mean, we talk endlessly about Manchester United, Liverpool, Tottenham, but this is, this is a big game. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the, the sort of possibly the future of, the, of, of both clubs depends on it because you go out of the Premier League and it, it's pretty tough to get back in and, and you know, jobs are at stake and, and it, 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 it's massive. I'm, I'm not sure when you're saying games of the season, you can actually extend that to the quality of the game because yeah. I can imagine it's it can be, it could be pretty grim because there is so much at stake. But, but absolutely, yeah. It feels like my worry for Brighton is, as everyone else down there has been fighting for a very long time. You know, Southampton now look clear of it, but they've been fighting for a long time. Cardiff have been fighting. I mean, that's what the Cardiff are good at. Um, and it feels like Brighton probably only now really think they're in a relegation fight. To me, they've just been sort of sleepwalking along. People have been ignoring them, assuming they're okay. And that, that could be very dangerous for them. Also, the match with the Suns is a good comparison because you see, you're not surprised when someone like Red, Redmond steps mm. up and, and shows match winning quality, but you, you're looking at Brighton at the moment and wondering who, who is going to step up, who's going to be a match winner, who's going who's to make a difference. And yeah. looking at that yesterday, yeah, completely lacking. Yeah, it was a shambles, wasn't it? Do we owe uh, Sean Dyche an apology? 39 points um, after that victory over Cardiff yesterday. They've got a tough run in, I've got to say. Chelsea, Manchester City. Um, Everton away and uh, finishing the season at home to Arsenal, but there were certainly doubts at the start of the season, weren't there? Um, well, I think for, you know, form justified it, didn't start? they? They'd had the you know getting into Europe and and all the, the the excitement of that, and it did sit you know for a while they were they were struggling to be Burnley, weren't they? they were struggling mm. to do to do basics well, but um, I I never thought they'd go down. Um, and uh, again, it's I mean if you've got a manager. This is the surprise of Brighton, I guess, because you look at them and you just think there's, you know, shrewd manager coach there, someone who gets the best out of some, you know, by Premier League standards, limited players. Um, as long as Burnley held their nerve with Deitch, I always thought they'd, they'd be fine. Mm. And I think everyone felt the same with Hewton, and that is the shock of, of seeing them suddenly right in the, in the thick of it. It's quite, it's, quite, it's quite interesting with Burnley because p people say, oh, they've, they've got tough games and all, but they actually play really well against the big teams, and they could play a really significant part in this title race because they play City at home yep. and, and City have it struggled a tiny bit in games like that. I saw Burnley play against Manchester United at Old Trafford in the middle of Solskjaer's brilliant run mm. and they were much the better team and actually played some decent football as well so they're not, they're not quite as limited as people think. Who, who's the best equipped Matt to, to stay up here? Well, I, I, just, I think Cardiff are probably too too far gone. I mean, I think they probably won't beat Brighton and that'll be, that'll be that for them. I mean, they've been punching above their weight just to stay in the fight. Um, I mean, South, Southampton have always looked too good to be in it and I mean, yesterday's result pretty much secured their safety, but their, their team sheets always look too good. Burnley, I've always fancied because they've got, they've got a plan, they know what they are, they've got an identity. Um, they're good at what they do, they just had to get back to doing it properly and, and they've done that. So I, I, I do think it will be Cardiff, the other ones to go. Mm. And if they do, Matt, will Warnock be there next season? Uh, I can't see it. I mean, he's sort of messaging from him seems to have flip-flopped around a bit. I think he's got a year left am I right, on his contract. Yeah. Um, but I, I suspect that will be that will be settled. Um, and um, yeah, he'll be he'll be moving on. Yeah, um, Huddersfield, as we know, um, already down. Newcastle, um, Southampton, big win for them yesterday. But do you think Newcastle just got a bit too much here? Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think they're probably just about safe already. But um, well, almost certainly. Thirty-eight points. Yeah, yeah but that, I mean, that will be enough. And and they, and 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 like Southampton, like Matt says, they they probably got that bit of extra quality for the teams teams that are down there. Um, you look at the Brighton and Cardiff sides, and that 
I don't think that they have the depth or the, the quality that Southampton and Newcastle, or, or even Burnley, in fact, have. So, it, it, I, Newcastle... I mean, 38 should be yeah, OK. Yeah. yeah, good stuff, guys. OK. Uh, of course, big game at uh, the Amex Tuesday night, um, Brighton against uh, Neil Warnock's Cardiff side. OK, next up, uh, we're going to talk about this story. Uh, Joey Barton, uh, new shame. This is following an, altica uh, an alleged altercation um, with the Barnsley manager at O'Croll um, yesterday after their 4-2 defeat. More on that coming next. Welcome back. Uh, with us this morning, Matt Dickinson, Matt Law and David Maddock. Let's just remind you what's in the papers this morning. Back page of uh, The Express, uh, Pogba, Paul Pogba saving uh, Lucky United coming off the back of that uh, defeat against Barcelona in the week in the Champions League, though. They did beat West Ham yesterday. It's looking good for Tottenham. Three wins out of three for them at their new stadium. Um, it's Palace. Um, Manchester City and another one for the big win yesterday against Huddersfield. Boy, that was great. Lucas Moura with a hat-trick yesterday. He's reflected on the front page of the uh, Sunday Times sports section as well. Uh, we've just been talking about Neil Warnock. It's the long uh, kiss uh, goodbye um, for Cardiff. Lost yesterday at Burnley, but they do have a big game, as we've been talking about on Tuesday night, the Amex against Brighton. Uh, Joe Barton, we'll come on to him right now in new shame. This is the back page of the Mail on Sunday. This is following an altercation, alleged altercation yesterday at Oakwell with the, uh, the Barnsley manager. He's on the back of the Sunday people as well. The tunnel brawl and uh, Barton bust up um, in the Sunday mirror as well, Matt. Um, so we'll have to tread carefully through this as ever. Um, but uh, trouble does seem to follow Joey Barton um, around. And this is the latest um, in a long line of um, very, very unseemly incidents that he's been, he's been caught up in. Now he's a manager of Fleetwood. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, I was just with tracing back. I mean, he got the job um, because he knew the owner from, yeah. from way back, and the reason he knew the owner was because he wanted to, to train with them when he was, um, I think it was on the 12-match ban from going way back to the um, Aguero yeah. uh, incident with, with QPR. Um, he, he then gets the job but has to wait until his ban um, for the betting. You know, he, start, he was appointed but then had to wait a, a couple of months to, to, to start it. So it, it's sort of, the context of this is already a sort of relationship forged out of, of, of previous incidents um, and he, you know, he got the job. I, I, you know, Fleetwood have, have not done um, badly this season. Yeah. I mean, you know, and jo Joey's, I've interviewed him a few times, he's got um, big ambitions in, in management and coaching. Uh, he certainly never lacked for self-confidence um, self in, in, in that regard, um, thinks he's got something to offer, but every time like this season uh, proves once again. Every time you think maybe um, he's he's sorting things out, something seems to land him uh, back in uh, back in trouble and, and brings all all of that all of it into question. Because Wait, when you yeah, Wait, when you have interviewed him, how do you find him as a person? What what, what do you see in front of you? Uh, all, all extremes. Um, you see, you know, he can be incredibly eloquent. He can be incredibly uh, honest about himself. Um, at the same time, you know, he, uh, you know, he's, he's talked about the, the 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 violence of his upbringing and how it was. Mm -hmm. You know, if he came home saying, "I've uh, had trouble with the next door neighbours," he's spelt it out. His dad would basically say, "You know, here's a baseball bat." Go and go and sort it out. That mm -hmm. doesn't uh, excuse um, his, his own violence through his life, but he he, he would say that that is context for it. Um, but it's you know the fact that he's been to prison. He's um, um, you know he's he's had to wrestle with uh, a, an awful lot of demons, and some at times he seemed to conquer. But here we are yet again, yet again. Talking about um, clearly ongoing struggle and not one necessarily he's winning. Yeah, and he's been involved in a lot of incidents, a lot of different area, a lot of different incidents over the years. Matt, he's transgressed a number of things. Um, you mentioned uh, the betting ban earlier, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I've never interviewed Barton myself. I don't think even as a player, um, but I must say when I've heard him on on 
TV, on the radio, and I've read interviews with him that people do. I actually often find he comes across quite well. I quite enjoy listening to him. He's got a lot of, you know, interesting, sensible views which he can articulate quite well. So, as someone who doesn't know him at all, I've always felt there's obviously two very, very different sides to him. And, you know, if he has transgressed again, it seems a shame because it does feel from just listening to him and reading about him that he, he would have something to offer. He's obviously passionate about trying to get into coaching. I mean, even if he knows the owner, he's gone into Fleetwood. It's not a particularly easy or glamorous job. Um, he gives the impression of someone who would work incredibly hard at it. So it'd be a massive, massive shame for him mainly if if he's if he lets himself down and, and passes up that chance because it it does feel like he's got something to give. Yeah. Um, we should just make it clear that uh, Fleetwood have said that uh, they're investigating the incident uh, themselves, um, but um, nothing further on that at, uh, at the moment. We do know that Jerry Barton was interviewed by police at Oakwell yesterday, or after that 4 2 defeat at Oakwell. The bigger picture, though, David, is this toxic environment that's here, that football seems to be operating in at the moment. Is there, has there been a particular trigger for that? Because it's not just Jerry Barton yesterday, and that's, just la that's the latest example of one of the game's serious issues. But if we also reflect on Social, the ills of social media, the keyboard warriors, uh, the typewriter terrorists, those kind of characters who are operating in, in, in a bubble and have got an opportunity and can very, very easily access the game's biggest personalities. I, th I think you've got to separate it out. I think, you know, let's put Joey Barton aside, especially because mm -hmm. we don't know what happened yet. There. And, 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 but there is a uh, toxicity around, did well to get that word out, <laughs> Uh, ar around the, the sport at the moment, and, and particularly, uh, racism seems to be seems to be sort of almost coming back to to be right at the forefront of of the of the sport again, and 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 that is is clearly very worrying. And and I think you're right. The, the, an element of that is this this uh, anonymity of, of from the the people. A lot of it is online. A lot of the racism is online, and and. Uh, for me, it's part. It's, it is a part of a wider problem in society, and I think if you look outside, you look at some of the language that's being used by politicians in, in the sort of political arena, for instance. Then, I think that that is is almost emboldening this, this whole sort of idea, of, and and football. Is, is kind of at the forefront of that because obviously you see in football clubs you see um, uh, races working together different different uh, ethnic sort of backgrounds all working together and and it, it then seems to attract these sort of extreme opinions about that and and I think it's really worrying um, it's not football's problem it's society's problem but but football as, as being so high profile clearly has to do something about it and mm. it probably needs to take the lead in, in that area. The it's thing I can't quite get about all this is that how, you know, racist people are disgusting, but how stupid it can be. I mean, we've had two instances this week of Chelsea fans in a bar singing racist songs and West Ham fans now on a tube um, singing anti-Semitic songs. How stupid have you got to be to not think these days you're going to get filmed doing that. And I mean, that is one area of social media which actually is, is probably quite good, that you can't now get on a tube or go into bar and sing these kinds of songs and have no chance of getting, and have a chance of getting away with it. Because I think now, 70, 80% of the time, someone in there might not be brave enough, because it would be incredibly brave to take these people on and say something, but they do get filmed and outed now. So how stupid have you got to be? to think you can do it anonymously and that you're not going to end up getting outed for it. And, and that is a good thing. Dave makes the point about football's got to take the lead, but does it have that, respons does it have that responsibility? Um, it's, it's got responsibility to do, to do what it can. I, I, totally, you know, I think John Barnes has been one of the most um, eloquent people about this because I think he dares to, to, to question... You know, his, his view is that football can land on this with a tonne of bricks, but that doesn't necessarily cure the, the bigger problem and I think he's a, a really necessary voice in it and you know it's really interesting even in the the black community there's different views some people think 
uh, you should walk off the pitch, Raheem Sterling comes out and says, no, you shouldn't. So it's, it's not easy to come up with, with one, you know, let's do this and that fix it, because ultimately, you know, as, as say as Barnes, I think very rightly says, you know, I think he's, you know, you can have a stadium and you can silence the racists. That doesn't mean to say you've got racism out, out of people, does it? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think there's a few good things that are happening. One is that young black players like Raheem Sterling and, and, and others are feeling emboldened and, and that they're going to be supported when they come out and speak about it. I think that's, that's been a really uh, encouraging trend of the, of the last couple of years. I think Matt's right that, you know, sort of self-policing among fans, if they see, you know, if they're seeing stuff going on that they think is outrageous, it's being filmed, it's being posted. I think the reaction, uh, uh, I think the media are far more alert and alive to it. I think we are rightly getting more involved in, in questioning it and pushing it. And I think the authorities, UEFA, FAs, etc., are coming under more and more pressure. But I think it's... So, yeah, football has a responsibility to do what it can while being a small segment of a massive societal problem. Can, can we compare say our first football experiences with going to the game now because if i look back at say the mid 80s david going to football matches and i would i i would say that the behavior that we're talking about on this table now was just accepted when you went to a game that's what happened whereas now we go to games and we see this and that type of behavior is completely unacceptable which is why we make which is why our senses are so refined to say well actually we live in a very, very different era now. We enjoy, we want to enjoy the football I think experience. It's, I think it's dangerous, it dangerous to say, uh, first of all, it, it wasn't accepted. People didn't accept it. I, I went to football games and I didn't accept it. Um, it was more accepted than it, than it is now. But, but, it's, but it's still what happened. Yeah, it, it, it certainly it absolutely happened. Just listen to, to the, the players who, black players who were playing then and, and listen to their, their experiences. But I think it still is happening. And I, and I don't think we, we certainly can't trivialise it. Um, I noticed last night Dijon, the, the French club, they, they uh, one of their fans was, was caught being racist in a game against, I think it was Amiens. And they said they are going to take legal action against against that their, their so-called fan. And for me, that that is, I think, what needs to happen. Instead of saying, "Oh, we'll give bans, we'll do this, we'll do that," it, 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 the, this sort of behaviour is actually a very serious criminal offence. It is against the law. And really, now it is time for for football clubs to do what Dijon did and to say we are going to take legal action against these people. We're not going to stand for this. And I think it is important that football makes this stand because, as I already explained, they're, they're, they're kind of at the forefront in so many ways. Um, and I think that football has this ability to, to get through to young people um, that maybe you know other areas of society don't. And, and, and if they can make a stand, if they can make it so that it is totally unacceptable, then I, I think that, that that would be a really huge thing. Can the clubs take more responsibility with their social media accounts? I think there was an example last night, Matt, of... Um, I think Chelsea tweeted Steven Gerrard slipping um, mm -hmm. in 2014. Uh, so the infamous slip back in 2014 at Anfield, game on today. Does that antagonise? Does that provoke people? in the build-up to matches? If it does antagonise or provoke someone, then it probably says more about the person than the Twitter account. If someone can't take that as something light-hearted, and if someone can't see that that is part of sport, is having a little dig at people, a harmless dig at people, or a harmless bit of fun, is part of supporting football, liking football, liking sport. We all do it, you know, we all support different teams or we like different things, we all have a laugh with each other about it. If you're the kind of person who can't take that for what it is, I think that probably says more about you. And I think we've got to be careful of being so, and I'm certainly not talking about racism here, let me just make that clear, yeah. of taking jokes so out of context that we, we stop making jokes because of the worry of, idiots becoming antagonised by them or becoming violent because of them. I, I wouldn't say that. And I, I would say, what I also would say is that West Ham's reaction 
very fast reaction to the anti-Semitic chanting on the tube has been excellent. Chelsea, actually, for all the criticism and the problems Chelsea have got with a, a small minority of their fan base, they are actually doing an awful lot and taking an incredibly hard stance. Look, the language they're using against their people, you know, they're making it clear, very clear, that they don't want these people anywhere near them. And they're using words like they're an embarrassment to the football club. That's what's got I to think, happen. I think that's huge. I, th I remember Jurgen Klopp over the Liverpool fans on the, with the Man City, but, and, and I thought I was really impressed. He came out and just said, this is unac you know, unacceptable. This is shaming, shaming our club. And I thought... More managers, more players, more owners need to be have that boldness to absolute. You know, the, the, the criticism. I mean, you're trying to get through to some mindless people, but the best chance you've got is if your own manager, your own mm. player, is saying, "We don't want you. You know, we, we, don't, we don't want this. We want you out." And I think that's you're talking about clubs using social media or whatever. I think more and more managers, owners, clubs um, use the use these star players use them to come out and say this behavior is totally unacceptable and yeah. i think i think that is the best that clubs can do yeah. well they, they can do plenty but they, they should be a lot more of that yeah i agree uh, strong stuff from the clubs this week strong stuff from strong stuff from the guests here on the sunday supplement as well okay next up uh, oh we're going to test them on their uh, knowledge of the championship it's coming next Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement. Following us uh, as ever this morning is uh, Goals on Sunday. Ben and Cammy uh, limbering up. They've got their Sky Ocean Rescue mugs. I like that. Um, they're on next, uh, Goals on Sunday, and uh, they will have Kevin Phillips, uh, Watford legend, Palace legend. He's been everywhere, Kevin Phillips. He'll be next on Goals on Sunday with uh, Ben and Cammy. OK, he knows a lot about life in the Championship, Matt, doesn't he? Um, Kevin Phillips, he was an expert at that level. Um, let's talk about some of the clubs. Let's, let's first hip switch. They'll be playing in the third tier of English football for the first time since 1957 yep. um, next season. Um, relegated yesterday after drawing at Portman Road at home to Birmingham. Um, I see Ipswich Town, I just think of this sad, sad state, the sad decline of what was once a very, very proud football club and a progressive football club. Mm. And now they've been relegated and they'll start life in the third tier, presumably under Paul Lambert, their manager. Yeah, well, whether Paul Malambert will be managed, I'd okay, imagine, yeah. is a question, because I'm, I'm not sure he's done very well. Um, but, I mean, they, they got sick of Mick McCarthy, didn't they? And it was one of those instances where a lot of people were kind of saying, be careful what you wish for. And it's difficult, because if you're a fan paying every week and you're sick of the football, and there are obviously a lot of Ipswich fans sick of Mick McCarthy's football, it's difficult to criticise them when we're not people who pay to go. Um, but Mick McCarthy was clearly doing, results-wise, a very good job at Ipswich because they've had a very tight, difficult budget for a very long time now in that division. Um, and he was p getting them punching above their weight. Mm. Um, and they tried to go a very different, a different route. I think it was Paul Hurst from Shrewsbury they, yeah. they took, um, who tried to bring in a lot of young players, a lot of players from lower divisions. Um, they talked a lot about sort of philosophy and then of course they, they started badly and threw it all out the window and, and went to Paul Lambert and they've just lost their way completely. Um, I suspect they would never get relegated with, with Mick McCarthy as manager in that division, albeit the fans might still be unhappy with the way they're playing football, but you're right, it's really sad. And it's, it would be a lot worse for them because obviously Norwich are, you know, Norwich are top of the division and absolutely flying. Um, so it couldn't, you know, the timing of it or the way it's worked out for Ipswich fans must be terrible. Dave, does it matter? You know, we, we always reflect on the history and the heritage of a football club and of course it's very easy for us with, it, with a club like Ipswich Town because well, mm. we lived through a lot of their success yeah. with Bobby Robson, goes on to manage the national team. Also, of course, before that, Sir Alf Ramsey, lead title win in 62, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but then go on to the Robson era and the FA Cup and of course the UEFA Cup. George Burley, 2000, they get into the, the, the Premier League. Um, but does it matter that it's Ipswich? Does it matter that it's any club? Does it make any difference who it is? The, the history, I think, kind of weighs heavily at, at times because obviously you, we're talking about Ipswich and immediately you're thinking of the Bobby Robson era, the success that they had, yeah. and, and that's the sort of level that they should be. When the finances will tell you that, no, they, 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 you know, they're not. No. A, a club at that level. I would say, I, I would kind of equate them to like almost say a Southampton and Southampton had uh, some success 
mm. around the same time as when when Robson was a manager, and um, Southampton um, did have a dip, and they came back, and, and because part in part because they've had quite bold. Uh, managerial appointments, um, it, clever ones, very intelligent ones, and then they've had a really, really good sort of uh, recruitment policy and youth policy. Whereas Ipswich, they lost their way completely. You look at the managers after Burley, and and really, you question so many of their appointments. Keen. Uh, uh, well, absolutely, but uh, um, and and Paul Hurst, you could argue that that was a bold one, but. Did he have the, the experience that they needed at that time? Did, but you look at Southampton's appointments and they keep appointing managers. And, and uh, Hassan Hootel, if that's yeah. how you pronounce it, was another really brilliant appointment. And they've had, they've had so many. And, and they've lost, like Pochettino is a fantastic manager. They, they, they lose them, but they, they seem to find managers. Whereas Ipswich, who are not a million miles away from the sort of Southampton level, mm. have just been disastrous both in the, their appointments managerially and also the recruitment as well. And I think, you know, maybe they, they need to look at the club itself and the structure of the club and, and, and a, you know, the, the, the board and, and look at what they can do and, and take, take Southampton as a, as a good example. I mean, a lot of clubs have been down, haven't they? So we look at, look at Portsmouth at the moment. Sunderland, Forest have been down. Leicester have been down. Southampton. Leeds, Sheffield Wednesday. Sheffield Wednesday. They've all had but a go. They've all done it. But that's, I mean, you know, it is a mad, uh, volatile division. Um, uh, and as a QPR fan, uh, well, Q, sorry, QPR season ticket holder, um, I, I certainly... I certain, How I can certainly, you forget who you actually support? I've never, what's that? No one's ever forgotten who they support and you just... Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a Cambridge United fan. My kids are QPR fans. I own three QPR season tickets. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I'm putting it. Shame um, you don't own the club the way they're going. The, uh, well, but exactly, you know, to talk about volatility, talk about, you know, this is a, a, a club that was... Flying high, throwing money at it. Next thing you know, you know if they get, they're looking for a new manager, and if they get the wrong guy, they could end up in in League yeah. One. So, you know, the, it's a division where you've got teams, some teams that are going down with with the parachute payments. They've got those sort of budgets. You've got clubs like Aston Aston Villa, big clubs who have got you know uh, bigger resources. You've got clubs constantly testing FFP, breaking FFP. You know, we saw what happened to Birmingham with their point deduction. There is the Championship is this fascinating sort of madcap mix of clubs with wildly different budgets, wildly different expectations, ambitions, histories, and on the one hand it makes it fascinating, but on the other it's, it's a basket case, um, sort of in terms of the way a lot of clubs uh, are run. Yeah. The brilliance of it is that it's no, it's no respecter of budget though really, is it? I mean, pretty much the Premier League will reflect the, the wage budget of every club, give a few exceptions. The championships just throw it up all in, in the air. Yeah. I mean, while we talk about Ipswich having a very tight budget, I mean, Mick McCarthy almost had them promoted with that tight budget at one stage. Yep. It, they got into the playoffs. You can, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's no respect of the amount of money you've got at all, which makes it fantastic, really fantastic. Who will get this, or who should, or who will get this QPR job? Because Carlos Carvajal um, has been linked with Sheffield, at Sheffield Wednesday, of course, Swansea. Uh, Mark Warburton, at uh, ex-Brentford manager, ex-Rangers. Uh, Tim Sherwood, mm. big, big pals. Mm. Yeah, Carlos of Les Ferdinand, That's, director of football there. That one's not getting my vote. Um, Carlos Carvajal would be interesting. I mean, he was he, Sheffield Wednesday um, better than I mean, Swans, the Swansea thing was just so short short lived. I'm not sure we're judging on that. Um, yeah. uh, Mike, I mean, Michael, I, I think they're bigger. <laughs> they've got to get it right, but at the same time. You know they are slashing, slashing the budget way back, and that's 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 the, the context of whoever comes in is that he's going to be playing a lot of kids. He's going to be trying to bring in. Uh, you know they 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 only stayed up because they brought in a couple of um, loan signings on big wages in uh, Naki uh, Wells and and Tom Ahmed, so they'll presumably be leaving. Um, it's it is this back to this championship knife edge where you do not have you can be a big club, you can have. Um, you don't have to get a lot wrong to suddenly find yourself on a, on a sort of spiral, yeah. um, as we've seen with, with the other bigger clubs. And, you know, Norwich, six, seven games in, everyone was saying, you know, Daniel Falk should, <laughs> should be out. Um, they're the best team I've seen at, at Loftus Road this season. They, they were fantastic. Yeah. And, and, you know, he was a manager who was ready to get sacked and is now flying high and leading them up. They are flying. Um, they play uh, Wigan uh, today. They've got, what, 85 points at the top. Not too far behind them, Matt. 
um, are Aston Villa. Big club. Big, big club. Massive club. It wasn't that long ago, and I did send you this the other day, didn't I? Yes. Um, via WhatsApp. Um, is I tried to remind you of a tweet. I don't know if I actually found it or could be bothered to search that far back. But you did tweet something along the lines of the season over. Let's prepare for next season. Um, I did. And uh, Dean Smith. I did also took note. tweet that we should uh, stick with Dean Smith when results weren't going well. I'll point that out. If yep. We're going to make WhatsApps public all of a sudden. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this could be dangerous. Let's not go there. Shall we? <laughs> but no, I mean, I think a lot of Villa, when Villa lost at home to West Brom 2 0, uh, which is only a couple of months ago, um, they were about 14th in that division, which just shows you. They then, I think they were. Went and drew at Stoke, and they've won eight on the trot now, which is the best in the league since 1975. Um, and that was the that was one of the last times they got up through the, the second tier before the Graham Taylor era. So, yeah, it's the turnaround. I mean, that's the other thing clubs can do in the Championship. You can go on these mad streaks. You can go on seven, eight game winning runs, and then you can very quickly, you know, lose four on the trot. It's a very streaky division for that. But if you put the run together at the right time, which Villa are. It gets you an awful long way and probably gets you in the playoffs. Can they can they sustain? So we're, at the, as things stand, four games to go. They're heading into the playoffs map. But can they sustain? This is sensational form. But can they sustain it till the end of the season? And then plus, of course, the two legs and then into the final. Yeah, they definitely can. They've got two tough last games. I think they go to Leeds and then Norwich at home. Um, but I mean, even if they don't win all of their last four and, and you know get it up to twelve on the trot. Yeah. Um, They've got massive momentum behind them now. They've got Grealish missed out yesterday with injury, but they've got uh, with illness, should I say? But they've got you know Grealish back playing fantastically. Forty-one thousand at Villa Park. Mm. I think they're sold out for the rest of the season. You wouldn't want to meet them, would you? They've got wind in their sails. Yeah, they certainly have. Okay, um, quickly, guys. You think you think they'll do it? Do you think they can go all the way? Through the playoffs. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be the one to jinx them. It's going to be my fault if they no, don't. No, then. Okay. You're not going to get me to say that. No we don't want to do that, Matt. Norwich and Leeds for you, and one other, which I think, would be... I think so. I mean, Leeds, we haven't even really talked about... I mean, what a fascinating story they've been all season with, with Bielsa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the nerves are... They just seem to be holding them off. I think Villa, Villa through the playoffs is, has to be the, the wise money at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see Leeds come up, because to see their manager in the Premier League, that would be fantastic. Yeah. It really it would. would be good fun, wouldn't it? They're certainly looking good at the moment. They won yesterday, they beat Sheffield Wednesday. They are in second place in the Championship. OK, next up, we're going to go from Championship to Champions League. Big game this week at the new Camp. It's Barcelona against Manchester United. More on that game is coming next. Welcome back. OK, let's uh, talk Champions League because it is a big week coming up. Uh, Barcelona, Man United, uh, Man City against uh, Tottenham on Wednesday, Porto against Liverpool, uh, which Dave will be at. Let's first up, let's talk um, New Camp, Tuesday night. Um, let's reflect on Manchester United's performance at Old Trafford, what you saw there, Matt, and then what we can expect from this United side in the second leg. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, I, I, I just don't see it. I mean, Barcelona won in second gear. Um, Did you think they were? Because some, the, the, the following morning's papers, I thought there was, a, I thought there was a very obvious divide between people who thought that this was a very, very comfortable Barcelona performance and that they, they hadn't, as you say, got out of second gear. But a lot of other people felt actually. This isn't the bar. This isn't vintage. Well, it's this not, isn't it's 09. Not, it's, this it's, isn't the 11. This isn't the 2011 side it, that wiped it, the floor with Manchester United. And it definitely isn't. They're, they are a patch, patchier team, I, I think. But they, I saw, I saw them the previous game against uh, home against Atletico Madrid, and they were better. You know, they were better then. Um, Arthur was was much better. Um, well, as a as a collective, Rakitic was much better. I thought they were. Yeah, by their standards. Which is never going to be as high as the, the, the great sort of 2011 vintage that they are. Um, they were ordinary against United, but still, you know, came out, came out with a win. I thought, you know, the fact, you know, United, you know, McTominay was the, their most involved, did well. Um, Fred, coming off a of ordinary season, did pretty well, but, you know, you're slightly clutching at, at straws. If you're going to the new Camp to win, um, say, good luck, uh, and Messi. You know, did one thing, set up a goal. Yeah. Um, he can obviously, um, yeah, turn it on if he chooses. Does the um, lock eventually run out? We saw, we saw them beat Juventus under Mourinho earlier in the season. I don't know well, how they, they did that. Was there that night? They, 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 they how they got through against again. PSG? I mean, the PSG away. You know, all the all, every bit of that game suggests they shouldn't shouldn't have won until 
you know, penalty. I mean, good luck to them for doing it. They, they, they hung in there uh, and, and Rashford held his nerve. But I yeah. think there was nothing else about that game that suggests they should have got through. And, you know, oddly enough, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is, is not a, a miracle worker. Yeah. Um, I, I think he's, you know, they are suddenly looking at the scale of the rebuild, which is, which is massive. Sure, sure. They are, again, compared to the top, compared to City and Liverpool in, in domestic, compared to Barcelona and the top teams in Europe, they are a significant, mm. significant step below. There are, you know, three or four players, 100, 200 million quid below. Yeah. Matt, um, we need to move on because we're running out of time. But Man City, Tottenham as well. Tottenham, are, are they? They've got the advantage. Yeah. Is it is it enough for them to take that slender, that single goal lead to the Etihad on uh, on Wednesday? I'd still imagine most people would make Man City favourites, particularly with with Tottenham's injuries. Um, I mean, I, I've actually always thought they can cope without Kane, but if they're missing, I mean, Deli Ali seems a bit touch and go. Winks would be a huge miss. Winks was superb against Man, yeah. Man City in, in the week, and they don't have an awful lot of options in that centre midfield, so I think Winks would be a massive miss for them. I think it'll be struggle for them, but I do think it'll be tight. I don't see them going there and getting you know, swept aside two or three nil easily. I think it'll be really, really nip and tuck and tight. Um, and you know, as someone who, who covers Spurs a lot and, and has watched them through this, this Champions League, which they've done really well, You've got to imagine that the group they're in was a nightmare group. They looked, it looked impossible for them to get through that. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done superbly well. They've kept upsetting the odds. So, you know, back them to do it again, maybe. Yeah. Um, you're off to Porto, aren't you, to see, uh, to see Liverpool? Yeah. Um, how assured, how accomplished did they look in, in the first leg? Because they're in, in the Premier League and, of course, Champions League too, against Bayern Munich, they're used to... Um, they've developed a habit of scoring a lot of late goals, but the job was done pretty early here. Yeah, it was a relatively comfortable performance. Actually, they didn't play as well as, the, as they have done mm. this season. It, the, the, against Bayern Munich, I think that was sort of peak Liverpool this season. Bayern Munich away, they, they, it was a, a performance that was absolutely top class. Destroyed them tactically. And, and that was such a, a, a wonderful sign if you're a Liverpool fan because it suggests that Liverpool really can mix it with, with the side. So, for instance, if Barca go through, I honestly don't think Liverpool, if they go through, will be too worried about it. Porto, uh, Porto away is... Y you would Porto have got a real dilemma now because last season they came out, had a go at Liverpool, got caught on the break, conceded five goals. So if they do that this time, they concede a goal, it's over. So they, they've, got, they, they've got this dilemma, do we come out, because they've got to chase the game, but if we do, we, we risk conceding a goal, and if we, we concede, then the, game, the tie is over. So that plays into Liverpool's hands a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. I, you would expect Liverpool to go through. The, the problem, I, I, looking at all the English clubs in, in Europe, is that the intensity of the games they've got coming up is a real problem for them, and that plays in Barca's hands. Yeah, sure, OK, we'll see how they all get on uh, this week. They're all in Champions League. All in Champions League action, should I say. OK, we run out of time today. Uh, thanks very much to the two Mats for joining us this morning and Dave as well. Good to see you. Thanks very much for coming on. Uh, 